uh, we're about to go to the next part of our today's uh, session, and uh, we'll uh, welcome Ben Berman. Dr. Berman is a member of the Innovator Support Team at uh, uh, seed office at NIH. Uh, and prior to supporting that office, Ben worked at FDA, at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Uh, he was both uh, as a lead reviewer uh, in the Division of Radiological Health, and he was also a research fellow in the Division of Imaging Diagnostics and Software Reliability. And he, he uh, also is a part uh, of the Mitre Corporation's Emerging Technology Innovation Center. And uh, so he wears multiple hats and we're very uh, lucky to have him uh, with us today to um, uh, lead the next presentation. Ben, uh, please uh, take over and uh, share your screen. Thanks very much, Eugene. Um, and thank you, Chris. Uh, very, very informative um, discussion around uh, drugs and biologics. And so I will be following that and uh, let me know if you are hopefully seeing my uh, presentation now. Perfect. Uh, let me modify this to show a smaller window. Okay, great. So um, just as Chris stepped through the um, requirements around uh, drugs and biologics and some first steps uh, for early stage researchers on this regulatory pathway, um, I'll be going through the different requirements for devices and diagnostics. Um, so Eugene already kind of gave this introduction, so I, I won't repeat that, um, I won't dwell on that, but uh, here you can see my photo from a year ago and compared to now how the how 2020 has taken its toll. Um, <laughs> but yeah, as, as, as Eugene says, um, I'm part of the innovator support team in the NIH Office of Extramural Research. Um, and we do things like this outreach activities to give innovators the tools they need uh, to be successful in their commercialization, um, including regulatory considerations. Um, so in the past, I've, I've worked at CDRH, I've led the review of, you know, countless 510Ks and pre-submissions and et cetera. So I'm, you know, here today to kind of talk about what are the different approaches you can take as you bring your device to FDA um, and, and how to get started. So um, keep in mind sort of our goal there is just a, a basic and broad understanding of these pre-market regulatory processes. And as I go through these, remember that there's going to be exceptions to a lot of the information that, that follows. I'm not gonna dwell on those exceptions. Instead, we're just gonna kind of paint broad strokes and we can get into some of the details perhaps in the Q&A. And also a disclaimer, of course, I don't work for the NIH or, or for the FDA. So uh, really this is just some guidance from my experience and uh, of course defer to, to the experts at FDA um, you know, when, you, when you get to that stage and you're interacting with them. So there are three main regulatory pathways to get your medical device to the marketplace. And these are called pre-market approvals or PMAs, de novo classification, or just simply de novo. And lastly, 510K pre-market notification, usually just called a 510K. And as you can see at the bottom there, each of these applies to different situations for the, um, the product that you're developing. And keep in mind, even though these are all three different regulatory pathways, all three of these are essentially a pile of papers uh, that outline all of the validation you've done, a complete description of your device, clinical testing and bench testing, and essentially all of the information FDA is going to need to make their review decision uh, for each of these different pathways. Um, but each of these is, is a pre-market submission uh, for FDA to review your device. So for established devices, meaning something like this is already um, on the market and FDA has already seen and classified this type of a device. Uh, they, they, they're broken down into three different classes, which roughly correspond to three different risk levels um, and correspondingly three different review pathways. So if you have a class three medical device, um, you could think of this as the highest risk uh, classification for a medical device. And if that's the case, then the applicable review pathway is called a pre-market approval or a PMA. If you have a class two medical device, then it is a medium risk or a controllable risk device where um, the 510K clearance pathway would apply. Um, and lastly, if you have the lowest risk, uh, in, in other words, a class one medical device, for example, a, a tongue depressor, 
um, as a class one device. If you have a new tongue depressor that you'd like to bring to market, you don't need to send a pre-market authorization um, application to FDA uh, before you bring it to, to market, excuse me. So that's for established device types. What about something brand new, which I'm sure many people in the audience are working on, you know, completely innovative technologies. Um, if that's the case, then by default, it is considered to have the highest risk. Uh, so it would go through the PMA process. But it, there's an alternative to that called de novo, um, where the goal of the de novo is to um, for, a, for a brand new device where the risk is medium or could be controlled so that it's considered medium risk. Um, essentially, when you submit a de novo application to, 510, to, to FDA, you're paving the way for future 510Ks. We're going to talk more about that um, in a few slides. So let's compare some numbers from each of these applications and talk about you know, which ones are most, uh, most common. So in, in the past two months or, or um, for, from August and September of this year, um, I'm pulling these numbers from FDA's website. There were nine original PMAs, there were six uh, de novo classifications, and there were 383 traditional 510Ks. So that gives you a sense of what is the most commonly, you know, utilized regulatory path um, and uh, to, get the, to get the devices to market. Um, and I, like, as I said, I'm pulling this information from the CRH public databases, and, and I'll, I'll be showing some examples from those throughout throughout the slides. And I think that Chris gave a great introduction to those. Essentially on these public databases, you're able to look up the regulatory decisions that were made on um, essentially all products that are on the market in the US. So let, we're gonna take a deeper dive into these three pathways, 510K, PMA, and de novo. And we're gonna try to have a better understanding of what these would be and when they would apply. So. First of all, FDA will determine based on your 510K if a device is substantially equivalent. And we're gonna go into what that means. Whereas FDA will determine based on your PMA if the device is safe and effective. And de novo, well, we're gonna come back to de novo after we discuss these two, but the main thing to keep in mind at this point is that whether your device goes through a 510K or a PMA or de novo, the, the goals of each of those is a different decision. In one hand, looking at substantial equivalence and the other looking at safety and effectiveness. And then lastly, for de novo, you're looking at how to control the risks that apply to that device. So before we get into those terms, um, really at, at the foundation of all of this is intended use and indications for use. So it's really easy to mix these two things up. I still do occasionally, but here's the uh, best way that I've, I've found to lay it out is that the intended use is the general purpose of your device. So what is it meant to do? Uh, very generally, whereas the indications for use are the conditions or the reasons or the technical situations where somebody will use the device. So here's an example. Um, I'm sure everyone here can guess what device we're talking about, but the intended use, broadly speaking, is to make images of internal structures of the body, okay? Whereas the indications for use are, images are derived from nuclear magnetic resonance properties, additional contrast agents may or may not be used. And when interpreted by a trained physician, these images can yield information to aid in diagnosis. So here you see much more context around that intended use, around that technological device. Um, and of course, we're talking about a MRI scanner here. So um, with that in mind, let's talk about 510Ks first. So FDA will determine based on your 510K if the device is substantially equivalent to a predicate device. So what do these mean? First of all, a predicate device is an existing device that already has 510K clearance or in some situations a de novo. And that predicate device, first of all, there has to be just one predicate device that your, that your product is substantially equivalent to. And it needs to have the same regulation as your product. It has to have the same product classification as yours. Um, and, and we'll see an example of that in a moment. Um, so substantially equivalence, um, there's multiple factors here, but the first, again, at its core is this about intended use. So it has to have the exact same intended use as the predicate device. Um, and it may or may not have different indications for use. Um, 
But as long as you have the same intended use, you don't have to have exactly the same device. It can, ha it can vary, it can have different functionality, it can have different technical characteristics. And where there are differences, it's just important that you bring FDA information, data, and justification that even though there are these technical differences, my product is still um, safe, as safe and effective as the predicate. So going back to the publicly available um, summaries that FDA provides and CDRH provides um, on their website, here on the left, we're looking at a regulation, uh, which um, you can tell from how, it's, uh, how the numbers and letters are uh, that correspond. So here, this is 21 CFR Code of Federal Regulations, section 892.1550. Um, and here from the regulations, what you have is a, a database of every existing product type, including their classification. You can see here um, that this is a class two uh, diagnostic device. Um, and it also includes information um, about the technology. Broadly, what is the technology and what is the intended use? So if you look here under the identification of this ultras ultrasonic pulse Doppler imaging system, it mentions that it is intended to determine stationary body tissue characteristics. So there you have, broadly speaking, the intended use of this ultrasound system. Whereas also publicly available are the decision summaries, um, in this case, the 510K summary for an actual ultrasound system. So this butterfly IQ ultrasound system is publicly available. What are the intended, what are, what are the in indications for use? And is you can see here, there's a lot more information about the context, the clinical applications where this ultrasound system could be used. And that's, uh, that's for the indications for use. Um, for example, here, peripheral vessel, um, gynecological, musculoskeletal, ophthalmic imaging, and then various technical modes of operation up for the scanner. So if you are developing a new ultrasound system, you would, uh, you may even use this as a predicate device, um, and it would have the same intended use of uh, determining stationary body tissue characteristics, but your indications for use could be different. Maybe you have different contrast agents, maybe you have different um, clinical applications or different modes of operations, and that's okay. It's just important when you submit your application to discuss what those differences are. So with a 510K, you're comparing your device directly to an existing predicate. Remember, one predicate device. Um, if you can't do that, um, then odds are you are uh, something new or, or something different or something high risk. Um, and in that case, you'll need to use the PMA pathway to prove independently of what else is out there that your device is safe and effective. So as Chris mentioned, as Chris really got us kicked off, that's really the core of this, is that if your device is safe and effective, then that means it has a high probable benefit versus the likelihood of injury or illness. In other words, the benefit risk ratio is favorable. Um, it also has to be highly reliable, especially in the context for which it is to be used. Um, and you can learn more about that through, through this uh, URL um, to, to the uh, regulations. So when you're demonstrating the safety and efficacy of your high risk um, you know, PMA device, it's typically done through clinical investigations. Um, and if you're submitting, uh, or if, if you intend to carry out a clinical investigation for a high-risk device, then it's possible that you'll need to file also with FDA for an investigational device exemption. So FDA not only does it authorize your device to go to market, but it also authorizes the clinical study of your device if it, in, if it includes significant risk. So a significant risk device is an investigational device. So this is one that's before it's uh, you know, gone through a PMA process or, or any other um, pre-market authorization process that um, has significant risk. So these include implants or the types of devices that um, support human life or are just generally high risk um, or of a, a, um, substantial clinical importance. So, as you're developing your device and you're thinking about the risk that it involves, sometimes it's straightforward. If it's an implant, you know it's significant risk and you know that this type of, this, that this investigational device exemption may apply to your clinical study. Um, other times it's less clear. And um, that's when it's important to remember that um, you're, you should already be working with your institutional review board um, to monitor and review the safety throughout your study and throughout your study development. 
And your IRV will be involved whether or not uh, your device is significant risk or non-significant risk, uh, provided it involves human testing, your IRV will be involved. So really that's the place to get that dialogue started. Um, and your IRB should know, hey, this, this is a significant risk device. It's time to start talking with FDA about whether an IDE may be necessary. So finally, we've talked about 510K and we've talked about DeNovo. Um, and the last uh, of the three paths to, to discuss is DeNovo. Um, so uh, FDA will determine based on your DeNovo if like before, the probable benefits outweigh probable risks, but this is um, really the key for a de novo application is that they need to ensure that regulatory controls provide reasonable assurance of safety and, effect and efficacy. So when you submit a 510K, um, there are controls that have been established, sometimes general controls, including you know, you know, general verification of validation, labeling, uh, performance data, uh, comparison of uh, similarities and differences to the predicate. These are sort of your standard uh, pre and post market requirements. Um, sometimes there are additional special controls. These are device specific requirements that in addition to provide to filing a standard 510k, you're going to have to tailor your performance testing in a specific way to make sure that for this device type, there's a specific performance test or specific labeling that, that you've met those controls that have been established. So when you file a de novo for your brand new device that doesn't exist yet, um, you're gonna be working with FDA to create special controls and pave the way for future 510K, uh, for future 510K applicants to um, you know, utilize those special controls and FDA will have assurance that as long as these controls are met, then these devices, that these new devices can use your device as a predicate. And I should just mention that it is also possible to have a de novo application for something brand new and have FDA classified as class one, in which case you wouldn't be paving the way for a future 510K, but instead you'd be paving the way for uh, future class one products, uh, which if you remember, may or may not require uh, pre-market authorization at all. Okay, so uh, we talked about the big three, 510K, PMA, and de novo. So what, what are these things? Uh, and and um, what, what are the things that these, uh, again, piles of paper that you're gonna send to FDA need to include? So the thing to keep in mind is that when you do, when you are, you know, strategizing and starting to prepare these submissions, remember that this is your argument. FDA only has this to go off of, that your device is ready to market. So you're gonna to need to include things like a very detailed description of your device. You're gonna to need to highlight all of the ways that your device is similar or different to what's on the market already. You're gonna to need to include performance data, statistical validation, clinical validation, um, everything you need to justify that your device is safe and effective or substantially equivalent. And your device, your application will ultimately include labeling, such as a user manual or performance uh, or promotional language. And that includes the indications for use statement that we saw before. So a great way to um, you know, try to build your indications for use statement is to look at those of similar existing cleared products from the FDA database. Um, and anything else, you know, if your device has a really special consideration that's not covered by um, any of these listed here, then uh, you know, add it in there. Uh, you know, bring it, bring it to FDA as, as an additional consideration um, under the most appropriate uh, section um, to, to provide uh, in your application. So, of course, we don't have time to go into exactly everything for every different type of application, but of course, all this information is available on FDA's website, whether you're preparing a 510K, a PMA, de novo, or an IDE. Okay, so where to start? We, you've got all these different pathways and you're not sure which one applies to you yet and you're not sure what it's gonna include. Well, the good news, just like Chris introduced, is that uh, CDRH posts their decision summaries on their website and that's a great place to get started. Even if your device is completely brand new, uh, there's probably something in that, in that area, in that clinical application, uh, similar device uh, with techn similar technological properties or similar intended use where you can start to look at their database and review those decision summaries, those 510K summaries, or those summaries of safety and efficacy from the FDA database because those summaries will include 
information about what kind of performance data they included. They're going to include that indications for use statement. And even just a simple, uh, it, you know, just knowing who at FDA reviewed it, which will also be included in that summary, it can be helpful for um, early stage uh, strategic development of your regulatory um, pathway. And of course, guidance documents. Uh, this is one example of a really helpful uh, flow chart because again, 510k, the most common regulatory pathway, all of the decisions that reviewers will be making based on your application are listed there in the document. So if you're not sure if um, you've provided enough information to, for them to determine, uh, for example, do the devices have the same technological characteristics? Well, um, provide that, that additional information so that they can get to the next step of their review decision and start looking at, you know, whether or not those methods are acceptable um, and whether or not the data demonstrates substantial equivalence. So all of it's lined out there uh, for you to step through from the guidance document. And then of course, utilizing your resources, um, whether it's uh, you know, idea networks uh, like Accelerate Health, the NIH seed office, um, you know, educational webinars like this. And of course, your academic collaborators, your institutions, um, a lot of them have a regulatory um, consulting support um, for uh, various stages of development. Okay, so um, once you've started to do some of the background research and you've kind of identified, all right, looks like I found a predicate and I think I'm gonna be preparing a 510K, let's start to think about what kind of standards are applicable and what kind of performance testing I'm gonna to need to do. Before you actually make that application to FDA, especially if, you're, if this is your first time, it's, it's best practice, uh, certainly to, to first submit a pre-submission meeting request uh, to FDA. And pre-submission meetings, uh, they serve a variety of purposes. Most commonly, it's just general questions about your anticipated submission, whether it's 510K, PMA, or de novo. You can use a pre-submission to actually determine the risk of your potential IDE. As I said, you're gonna to wanna to talk to your IRB about whether or not that uh, seems applicable uh, for, for your study. Uh, you can make breakthrough device designation requests. You can have discussions for ongoing applications. There's a wide range of things that pre-submission meetings are used for. And best of all, they're completely free. So this is a formal feedback from FDA, very substantive. They meet and they, you know, internally they'll discuss your, your, your questions and your technology. They're going to give you substantive feedback within three months and you'll be able to meet with them uh, from, from teleconference now, of course, um, but in, you know, in general, you could, you can meet face to face um, and, or oh, of course you could also elect to just receive written feedback and the FDA is uh, happy to do that as well. So um, here's a quick example of, um, as I said, you really want to start to think about this pre-submission after you've done your homework, after you sort of put your first, uh, you know, plan together. Um, so one of these is a good pre-submission question. The first question is, how should we design our bench testing validation plan? The other question is, does FDA agree that the bench testing plan as we described sufficiently quantifies the accuracy and precision of our device? So of, of course, uh, the better question is the second, assuming that you have uh, sufficient, sufficiently described your bench testing plan. The thing to remember here is that FDA is not going to design your product development strategy for you. Um, they're not going to um, be your regulatory consultant. Um, it's important for you to bring your argument to them for them to review and uh, discuss with you. Of course, they're gonna be as helpful as they can uh, based on what you provide them. So um, it's important that you, you give them something to respond to. Okay, so um, before we get to the Q&A, um, I wanna talk briefly about diagnostics and digital health. Um, so while diagnostics are not my um, area of expertise, uh, it is important to remember that diagnostics are medical devices and they can also be uh, biological products. Um, but as medical devices, they are subject to the same regulatory procedures as other devices. So we talked about 510Ks, we talked about PMAs, we talked about de novo and IDE. All of these are applicable um, to diagnostics as well. Um, and you're gonna have to find out which one is most suited to yours. Um, now, you'll also need to keep in mind that there are some additional standards and requirements for lab tests and lab test manufacturers. So uh, we talked in the Q&A about CLIA waivers um, and, and, or more generally, uh, the clinical laboratory improvement amendments. So if you're uh, bringing your uh, in vitro diagnostic to market, excuse me, 
you may be interested in a CLIA waiver because that opens up more opportunities for customers of, of your um, laboratory test. So with a CLIA waiver, more labs will be certified to utilize the, your lower risk product. So from my understanding, if you're, if you're seeking a CLIA waiver, uh, then I copied this language exactly because I, I really like how they worded it here, that your goal is to demonstrate that the test is accurate as to render the likelihood of erroneous results by the user negligible. <laughs> In other words, you want to make sure that as people are using your diagnostic, um, they're not you know, interfering with the expected accuracy or precision, that it's, develop it's been developed in a user-friendly way um, that's not going to compromise uh, the results of the test. Um, so I'll just last mention is that it is possible to seek a CLIA waiver alongside your 510k application. Of course, if your IBD for whatever reason uh, wouldn't be able to use the 510k pathway, then um, you may not be able to seek simultaneous uh, CLIA waiver. So an example, um, a, a current example of FDA's uh, regulation of diagnostics, of course, is for the um, ongoing pandemic. And NIH has been working hand in hand with FDA to try to bring, uh, you know, COVID-19 diagnostic tests to market in a, um, in a, as you see here, with a test capacity of 2.7 million tests per day. That's the goal. So to do that, um, FDA has worked to streamline uh, the regulatory pathways to market um, and reintroducing this pathway for emergency use uh, called the emergency use authorization. And that's already been used for 280 uh, or more uh, diagnostic tests for the current pandemic. Um, and through this process, tests uh, can be marketed uh, specifically for uh, COVID-19 in this case. It's been used in the past for other uh, crises like the Zika virus. But for now, uh, you know, if you utilize the EUA, um, then what you do is you submit a, a streamlined uh, application to FDA, and, and it may include a template, it may include some additional discussion of your validation. Um, and if approved, you're, you, you haven't gone through the 510K or PMA process, it means your device can only be used, your diagnostic can only be used during this uh, current emergency. Um, so as I said, this is a, uh, there's a lot of activity around this right now, um, understandably, and NIH has been working very closely with FDA to make sure that uh, this is as streamlined of a process as possible um, while maintaining the safety and efficacy of these diagnostics. Okay, the, um, the very last topic is digital health. And while many, may be, many medical devices uh, contain software, and there are a lot of resources available online about what FDA will expect to see related to that software, there are other cases where software itself is a medical device. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, radiological image processing software tools, you know, measurements of uh, image uh, quality or uh, you know, features of, of, of a radiological image, smartphone apps that may utilize external sensors. These are examples of regulated medical devices. Um, on the other hand, there are other types of devices such as video games that motivate physical therapy or medication tracking tools that actually might be medical devices, but FDA has already communicated that these types of products are under enforcement discretion, meaning FDA does not expect to see these um, and as, uh, um, before they go to market, they're not expecting to see these come in as 510Ks. Um, instead, uh, they're exercising enforcement discretion. And then, of course, there's also examples of software that just simply is not a medical device. Um, and examples of these are software that just accesses patient health records. Um, that does not necessarily make it a medical device or um, electronic medical dictionaries, more broadly speaking, educational tools um, are not uh, medical devices. And uh, here are six examples, but FDA has a guidance document um, that includes uh, many, many, many pages of more examples about for each of these three categories. And if you're developing a product in the space, just remember that this is rapidly changing and the lines between these three categories may be shifting or they may not be always be clear. Um, case in point, even the Federal Trade Commission has a tool online to try to help you figure out which uh, regulatory requirements may apply. And to, you know, FDA offering even further support for uh, developers in this space, um, you know, if you're asking yourself this question, can you help me determine whether the FDA would consider my digital health product to be an actively regulated product? The answer, thanks to FDA's website, is yes, and you can reach out to them with just that question uh, through through the, uh, through this email address. 
So recap, um, we talked about the three main pre-market authorization pathways at FDA, 510K, de novo, and PMA, and your PMA, and any of the three may or may not involve a clinical study that, that requires an IDE. Um, but more importantly, we talked about the resources um, that are available for you to start to come up with your strategy toward one of those three paths. Uh, the public databases and the decision summaries of all the products that are currently on the US market. Um, you've got SBIR support uh, through, uh, through your reach hubs, through idea hubs, uh, through NIH seed. Um, reach out to your local resources. And, and to gain the support you need. And of course, um, when it comes to devices and diagnostics specifically, the CDRH Office of Communication or the Division of Industry and Consumer Education is fantastic at fielding you know, general regulatory questions. Um, and I think your first steps down, down these paths is to really utilize those, research, utilize those resources and do your homework, of course, building toward that pre-submission meeting request. Um, and, you know, Engage early. Uh, with CDRH, uh, there's no limit to the number of pre-submission meetings you can hold. And you might want to have several leading up to your, your ultimate uh, first application, whether it's a 510K or a de novo or a PMA. You might want to have one pre-submission meeting focused on identification of a predicate. You can have another pre-submission meeting focused on your you know, validation strategy. And that can uh, build organically toward um, a, a, a successful uh, submission to CDRH. So with that, um, I'm happy to get to the Q&A se session. Um, here are some helpful uh, re links to get a hold of me or Chris um, and learn a little bit more about the uh, small business resources that NIH provides. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, would you please uh, unshare the screen and we'll go to some of the questions um, you know, that, that we had. Uh, you know, the first question uh, I will have to voice out because uh, the, you know, the person who asked it uh, uh, you know, said that uh, she needs to um, uh, leave the, the meeting. Um, uh, she's asking, will the speaker, that's coming from Becky, uh, ASRIP, uh, our sister hub, Sharp Hub, um, um, out of the central idea states region, uh, will the speakers please address what is required for a drug device combination? Um, so that's a great question. Um, and when it comes to a combination product, uh, FDA will be trying to determine if it hasn't been already determined for this type of a product, what is the primary mechanism of action? So whether it's the device part that is the most fundamental to the therapeutic or the diagnostic, or whether it is the small molecule or biologic that is the most fundamental to this given product. And so based on that determination, that will sort of route your regulatory path one way or the other. So are you going to need to submit a PMA or a new drug application? That's going to be based on that primary mechanism of action. And you're definitely going to need to know what that is. Um, but also, you know, early, early on, remember that, you know, fundamentally, uh, the questions are similar. You know, you're going to need to prove, you know, clinical validity and do, you know, whether it's bench and animal testing and draft your indications for you. So when it comes to that sort of early stage product development, I would say uh, don't, don't be, too, you know, um, there, there's still a lot of resources and ways to build out your regulatory strategy, even before that formal binding uh, primary mechanism of action has been determined by FDA. Okay. Uh, Chuck, Chuck M, uh, you have a uh, question that uh, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and ask yeah. a question. Uh, thanks. I thought when you talked about a 510K, you said it had to have one predicate, one device. I have a technology that uh, has one indications for use, and I want to use it for completely different indications for use. And I thought I could combine two devices because there's already devices for the second IFU. Um, that's a great question, and this comes up pretty frequently. So um, ultimately, your device will be um, classified as, under one classification, so one classification for one device. And so um, in this case, it's possible that your new version of the device, it, it really depends on the change in the indications for use. So if you change the indications for use, it, it doesn't mean the, um, you know, it could be more broad or more narrow, uh, and that's 
okay, but if you're completely changing the intended use and it's really being used for an entirely different application, then it may be that for that uh, new application, you need to find a new predicate and that version of the device would be, uh, would, go, would go with that. Um, it, so another thing to keep in mind is that even though you can have one, only one predicate device, you can utilize reference devices. So if, if in showing that your device is substantially equivalent to one product, you need to rely on additional um, reference devices and bring in information and show similarities to other products, you can do that. But ultimately, your, your, your device will be classified under just one existing classification. And it can be a challenge. Uh, so this is definitely a, a, a good point of discussion to bring to a pre-submission meeting saying, you know, hey, we'd like to broaden our indications for use, uh, but we're not sure if we're changing our product type, you know, could, you know, and that FDA can uh, provide some guidance um, around that. Okay. But ultimately, 510K, uh, one predicate. Okay, thanks. Yep, uh, Danny Shu is asking, will a webinar recording be available? Yes, it will be. Um, already commented on that. Uh, Chris Guesswine uh, from Clemson, would you please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yeah, Ben, thanks for your time. It's a great, mm -hmm. uh, great session. Hey, listen, so those of us that are on the front line sitting in academic tech transfer and whatnot, you know, we see, we see quite a few devices coming, coming our way, pretty early nascent technologies. You know, one of the big decisions or risk factors whenever we make a decision to proceed with protection is always regulatory. Um, so I was just curious, is there a mechanism for, for nonprofit foundations to get some kind of feedback from the FDA, or is that primarily reserved for for-profit organizations and we would need to consult mm -hmm. the regulatory consultant to get some kind of read on, you know, what the path would be? Okay, so could you give an example of the sort of question that it, as like a, you know, a third party working in emerging technologies, um, what are some of the questions that you might you know, bring to FDA and try to and sort of seek some guidance on. So we got an optical fiber technology, for instance, that has a that has a heat gradient along the axis of the fiber, right? And we're we're thinking there's an ablation opportunity for that. But trying to figure out exactly what product class something like that may fall under, whether that would be electrical or uh, thermal, you know, I guess it would depend on the on the on the space. So you know, we have these kind of in between questions. Yeah. Frequently. And so yeah. something like that. I, I think, um, you know, first of all, some of the resources that we linked and we, we talked about. So if, if that type of a product is on the market already um, or, or that, you know, a similar technology exists, looking at some of the, you know, data that FDA looked at to determine safety and efficacy. So, for example, if they did some kind of electromechanical stability, if they did some kind of thermal conductivity testing in support of their application, then that would be available online. But if, if you know, if you're really working with, uh, you know, prototypes of devices and you know cutting edge products that maybe FDA hasn't even seen yet um, then in that case you may as you said you may need to be looking at you know different you know third party regulatory uh, consulting groups or or just uh, you know the company's innovators themselves okay thank you thank you uh, John Birch uh, you're next uh, unmute yourself please sure thank you very much uh, I really have two questions one is why are electronic medical records not devices. They certainly meet the definition. They're, they provide information that's used for medical decision making, just like a thermometer or a lot of other minor kinds of things, yet they're far more important. And secondly, looking forward, uh, now that the new interoperability rules have been changed or been, or will be enforced, there's bound to be a huge rise in personal health records. Uh, and in fact, even a movement towards storing them in data banks, where you really just store your longitudinal lifelong data records uh, and that information will certainly be used for decision making as new digital health or SAMD apps get developed that process that huge voluminous data uh, for by patients and by their clinicians it's going to become some say the, the new source of truth uh, better than EHRs themselves even though a lot of that data comes from EHRs anyway the basic question is why are EHRs as currently <laughs> existed uh, not regulated, and and will PHRs, should they be, I guess is really what I'm saying, in order for them to be used for their potential uses? So that is a great question. Um, and, you know, it's, 
FDA operates on the precedent that's been set. Um, and before we had EHRs, you know, we, if we built our way there from, you know, health records, pen and paper. And, you know, those records, uh, I don't know if we would say that those were medical devices. Maybe we could, maybe we couldn't. But, you know, another thing that FDA is a very, um, you know, of course, fundamental is that they do not regulate the practice of medicine. So, you know, they don't want to regulate the type of content that gets put in that, uh, that record. They don't want to regulate which file cabinet you put it in. And now in 2020, that is electronic and that's a cloud database of everything, but it's really built its way there from sort of a fundamental doctor patient record, um, which FDA, you know, has, has no authority over. Um, in, in the sense of the, as a practice of medicine. Now, there are definitely uh, big questions around those, uh, you know, data storage and cybersecurity related to patient health records. And FDA is engaged with this digital health community. They're trying to find the best way to do these sorts of things, but it doesn't mean that they're expecting your, you know, uh, the app that you use to look up your, you know, test results. Uh, you know, that's, essentially a communication between you and your doctor, um, and, and it doesn't fall under um, FDA regulation. Well, we're technically out of time, but if uh, uh, Ben is available to answer a few more questions, that would be uh, great if you guys can uh, stay a little bit longer. Those who are interested to hear the answers, uh, you know, you were absolutely welcome to stay. Uh, the next one is Dan Lee. Uh, would you please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you, Ben, for a wonderful uh, presentation there. It was really informative. So my question really comes down to what do you mean by you know, an educational device being not a medical device? Does, it then, does that definition get dictated by the context in which a potentially medical device is being used, even if we know that it may eventually become a medical device used by practitioners? Let's say we have an image processing software that's being used to help train or learn radiologists uh, or future radiology, future radiologists um, in, in patient clinics. Is it, let's say, scenario-wise, context-wise, an educational device if it's only used in classroom setting without patients, but then if they're also using it to learn how to use it with a patient kind of protocol, diagnostic protocol with patients in patient clinics, does that suddenly now become uh, regulated with the medical device kind of expectation? I think the big question is how does it intersect with patient treatment uh, or patient diagnosis? So if it's an educational device, then it's meant to pre-inform and provide context for various practices outside of the, you know, one patient's, you know, uh, treatment plan or diagnosis, whatever it may be. So if it's truly for educational purposes, whether it's, you know, helping people visualize uh, the type of a procedure that could be used, for example, like maybe augmented reality or virtual reality system where, you know, you're in the surgical suite and you can, you know, practice your, um, you know, various strategies or, or learn different processes that, that are applicable for, uh, for the intended use. That's an educational device. Um, I gave the silly example of a medical dictionary. Of course, that's just to help inform, you know, people, whether it's patients or doctors, about um, medical practice. Once you start to inform that with patient-specific information, and once patient-specific decisions could be made based on that information, then it stops becoming an educational device, and it starts to become a med medical device. Um, and it's it's very important that um, if it's an educational device, it's only marketed as an educational device. It's only uh, promoted as a medical device and sold as a, uh, sorry, excuse me, it's only marketed as an educational device and um, sold as an educational device. And um, even could be best practice to include some warning that um, this is not cleared or approved for um, clinical use. Yeah, thank you. all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question is uh, uh, Nancy. Uh, Nancy Gu again uh, is interested in the CLIA versus FDA approval. I think that um, uh, you know Chris has started answering that question, and that is a long uh, answer. Uh, if you don't mind, um, uh, you know Chris and Ben, uh, I would like to facilitate a f you know follow up after you know this event for uh, Nancy, um, you know, who is a very active participant in several programs of our hub. Great. Uh, you know, to talk with you uh, after after the call to get a little bit more uh, clarification of that. Happy to. Okay. Absolutely fine. Love to. 
Fantastic. Uh, the next one is Greg Bashford. If you could unmute yourself. Sure. Hi, Ben. Thanks so much. Wonderful presentation. I'm curious if there are costs involved in getting FDA approval, say for 510K, uh, beyond that which you uh, incur yourself, costs to sure. the FDA themselves, and what would be ballpark figures? Yeah, absolutely. Um, great question. Uh, I mentioned that the pre-submission is free, but I didn't mention anything for the others. So as a small business, I believe that your first 510K application, the cost is waived. Um, uh, all this information, so if you kind of search CDRH uh, application costs, you'll find exactly what those numbers are. Um, so for, uh, so generally, um, it, so maybe I should, uh, I'm a little un uncertain now that I think about it if the first application cost is waived or if the first application cost comes at a reduced, uh, at a reduced rate, but you can find that information online. Ballpark, uh, 510K is around, tens of thousands uh, for the application cost and a PMA or a de novo is ballpark hundreds of thousands of dollars for the application cost. Um, so check it out online. Um, you can find out exactly what those are. Of course, as you said, that's just the, that's just uh, from you to FDA, uh, you know, as you develop your 510k and as you develop your PMA, the, you know, the, those incurred costs certainly add up to higher than what those are. Sure. Thanks. So this is Chris. If I can just jump in for a second, I did drop the link into the chat for the um, medical device user fee costs, and I believe Ben, you are correct that the first filing for a 510k from a small business is waived. However, even subsequent uh, submissions can be at a reduced rate from the full Medufa, what is called the Medufa fee. Uh, and that is, uh, you need to qualify each year. You need to recertify each year as a small business, and they tell you exactly how to do that if you read through that website. Thanks, Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and Chris, you dropped it in the uh, in the private uh, you know message to me, but I posted it. Oh, well. I'm sorry. No worries. No worries. Uh, uh, Thank you. Yep. Uh, Yin Yan Lun, uh, uh, if you could unmute yourself, uh, you have a question on digital therapeutics. I know you were in touch with us before before the event. You were particularly interested in digital therapeutics. Go ahead, please. Yes. Um, currently, our technology um, has patents um, to display risk and quality um, information to practices and um, health organizations, health plans. Um, so if we are moving towards um, this digital health evolution to um, stratify patients who will maybe at higher risk for complications for COVID um, related, you know, disease states, mm -hmm. would we still fall under um, as a medical device rather than more of an educational thing to educate practitioners on how to um, stra risk stratify mm -hmm. our patients? It sounds like, uh, kind of similar to the previous question, if you're stratifying the risk of a specific patient, um, in that case, it's, it would be a medical device. Um, question, there's still a question of whether or not it's a class one or a class two, um, you know, and, and you know, so, so there's, you know, there's some additional details and questions about specifically the kind of information and how it's being conveyed. Um, but yeah, it, so if it's going to be sort of for educational use, then that would not directly inform any individual patients, you know, treatment or, or diagnosis or risk stratification. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that's interesting you mentioned is about the patented uh, technology. So in my experience at CDRH, um, there's not any sort of uh, listing of intellectual property that comes along with your 510K or de novo or, uh, or uh, maybe in some cases PMA, but for the most part, um, CDRH is pretty hands-off when it comes to intellectual property. Um. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have three more questions uh, listed. Please don't ask any, any more, but uh, are you okay, Ben? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Robert Duasi, I hope I did not uh, mispronounce your name too much. No, Robert. that's fine. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, First of all, thanks to both presenters for really educational um, uh, information. And I'm not, I'm not sure if my question is actually that relevant because it's more in the public health domain. 
So different types of sequencing, not just metagenomic sequencing, but I think also PCR-based assays have been used with wastewater influent um, in institutional and public sewage systems for early detection of infectious agents, including SARS-CoV-2. What is the regulatory status of these types of um, detection assays for public health? Um, that is a great question. Uh, to be honest, I am not entirely certain, um, but uh, kind of similar as we were talking before about how that technology interacts with, you know, a, a given patient's, you know, care or, or treatment. Um, I think uh, my guess <laughs> is that uh, th this would not nece necessarily fall with under FDA oversight. Um, and these sort of public health records or uh, historical data that can be used to inform, you know, bulk decisions uh, from from a healthcare provider or or a local community um, is different than uh, a medical device, uh, which which would be doing that on a on a patient specific level. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Connie uh, Luthi or Luthi. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce correctly your last name, Connie. If you would uh, unmute yourself, Connie. Uh, the question is on the scientists and engineers at FDA review labeling and manufacturing sites to protect human health. Uh, what is a medical record uh, requires review by scientists and engineers in order for it to be safe? Um, so regarding the labeling, absolutely. The labeling is thoroughly reviewed by scientists and engineers at, at, at CDRH. And what they're really looking for is that the labeling matches the, um, the intended use and the indications for use for your product. So if you, um, you know, the, your, your promotional material and your user manual needs to help people use your device for how it's meant to be used and how you've proven that it can be used uh, based on your clinical validation or animal testing, whatever it may be. So you have shown that the device can be used in a certain way and the experts at FDA are really just making sure that your labeling aligns uh, with that use. Thank you. Uh, John Birch, last but not least, go ahead. Okay. Thanks. One more question, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, with the growth in more and more precision medicine and narrower and narrower product populations for given drugs, uh, of course, that's changing the economics of the industry tremendously because it still costs a billion dollars to develop a single drug. But if it's not a blockbuster anymore, it's very hard to pay for it. So there's growing, inf growing need for better information at the patient-specific level. Um, are there adequate natural, I, I guess I specifically singling out natural history studies. Uh, again, it goes to my PHR idea from before. If we can, if more and more patients do collect their own personal health records, those will be natural, natural history studies, uh, assuming they're done to some extent consistently. <clears throat> Could, is, is, there, is there with growth in precision medicine and rare diseases as well, of course, uh, the need for more and more natural history studies? And could, is it possible that these PHR-based databases might provide that need? Um, that is a great question. And, um, you know, what I can say is that FDA has absolutely shifted focus, especially in this digital health space, to patients' patient-specific care, empowering the patients to make their own decisions based on the data that they have in hand. So while FDA is really engaged with the medical device industry and finding new and better regulatory approaches to facilitate that, um, specifically with the, you know, in the context of you know, natural history studies, um, I'm, I'm, I can't comment, uh, but I can say that absolutely that this is an important area of focus for CDRH. And I'd like to contribute also Good. that- I, I was hoping you would. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's, it's very true. Natural tr history studies are sort of a unique little animal. And in order to get one um, sort of agreed to as baseline data or representative comparative data by FDA requires some very intricate discussions. But in addition to the use of longitudinal single patient data or multiple patient data as 
a uh, as a surrogate for a cohort arm. There's also a growing appetite in FDA for the use of real world evidence and real world data. And so it is possible and much more probable that that would be a use as opposed to a independent cohort natural uh, history study that you'd be able to take, for instance, commonly used tests. If you're you know, looking to develop a new cholesterol lowering drug and you gather a cohort of patients who either are or are not taking statins of some sort over a, a 50 year period or a 20 year period, however long it is since they've been on market, right? And then you compare those outcomes to a outcome for one of your technologies that you're developing. And that I could see that being a little bit more of a use of the electronic health records, especially for some of the um, accountable care organizations that really do keep longitudinal data. Might be a little bit harder for a person like me who's skipped between probably a dozen different health plans throughout my career. But That's for someone who's been pretty consistently with a, uh, with a given provider, that might be a little easier. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, as you said, that kind of unlocked, you know, my brain there, what, mentioning real world evidence or real world data. I think though that's, if you look that up on CDRH's website, you can learn a lot more about how they intend to use that more and more in these applications um, in, 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 the, in the coming days and years uh, for, for medical device development. Um, and that absolutely intersects with the in, electronic health records and the various, you know, data that's out there for the medical devices in use. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Chris and Ben, uh, uh, on behalf of uh, all the participants today and on behalf of uh, our hub, our sister hubs within NHGMS Idea States Network, all their proof of concept hubs uh, in the REACH program that participated, uh, you know, today and everybody else who uh, was in, um, uh, in the room with hundreds of people uh, we had 420 people uh, registered for the event. People were coming and going, so uh, not all of them were in the room at the same time, but we had a very large group uh, listening to you today. Uh, great presentation and a great impact. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you to NIH for letting you uh, share that knowledge uh, with all of us. Thank you. I appreciate that. Have a great afternoon. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye-bye. Wonderful working with you again, Eugene. Thank you. Likewise. Bye-bye, everybody.